first up, how are you? You okay, hon? You okay, hon? You okay? Oh, surviving. Surviving yeah. through COVID. Like I was saying, thanks for coming on and talking to us today. So I want to get into it straight away. So obviously you're an art psychotherapist and I think I'm not alone in saying that a lot of us don't really know or have heard of art psychotherapy. So I wanted to, if you could, just tell us a bit about art psychotherapy, some of its benefits and sort of um, what it's used for essentially. You're definitely not alone. Um, I hadn't heard about it until 2015. Um, I was introduced to it by an artist I was working with at the time. It kind of combines art and mental health and I didn't realise you could have a career in that. Um, so I've pursued it since then. Um, but art psychotherapy is basically a form of therapy that uses art as a means of communicating. So if you think about a really difficult conversation you have to have with like a parent or a friend, it's, it's kind of easier to do it when you're doing something else. Um, so art can kind of help with that. It can be like a, a thing in the room or an object that you're creating to kind of occupy yourself whilst you talk about something really difficult. Um, and it can also be used to, to kind of express feelings in a really physical way. So if you're really angry, you could create a really big messy painting um, and create an embodied image. Um, but mainly it's used for communicating and expressing things that you might just struggle to um, vocalize. So it's good for people um, with learning difficulties or perhaps children who, who don't have the right language. So it's not just for, so you don't have to be sort of a creative, it's kind of for the ev the everyman almost that you can come in and sort of take one of these sessions and sort of things. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think because I have an artist identity and I've, I, I'm still having art psychotherapy. At the beginning, I was quite worried that I would create bad artwork and, and be judged on that. But that's not what art therapy is. It's about creating artwork to look at how you feel. Um, so I think maybe being a creative can make you feel like you have to do a really aesthetic painting where it has to be a certain style. Whereas art therapies, I'd say it's more free than that. Um, so you don't have to have any art experience. And it could be for anyone, really. Okay, so like... So I come in, I come in for a little session with you. So in terms of like me coming in for the first time, what would a normal session sort of look like? What sort of things or techniques would we sort of go through? I know you sort of touched on them a little bit, but I come in, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with one thing. What is the sort of, the sort of process that you would go through? So the main, the main thing that all um, kind of sessions would have in common is it would be hopefully in the same space. So the same room, same setup, same materials, and the same time. So consistency is really important with um, creating safety. Um, and yeah, you try to keep that as regular um, as, as possible for the client. In terms of um, different types of mental health or um, disabilities or treatments, it really depends on the client. Um, for example, I've worked with people with um, schizophrenia and sometimes it's quite helpful to just sit back and let them create artwork and talk if they wish. For other people, it can be really scary to just be in a room with loads of art materials and seemingly no direction. So sometimes I might uh, suggest as an option, um, you know, could you draw how you felt at that time or is there a word that comes to mind? or just guide them to the materials and encourage them to um, maybe just test them out. Maybe, maybe these people haven't um, actually used art materials before, so it might be an opportunity to try something new. I guess so. So, I mean, um, I think so for someone who doesn't really, or someone who just reads the term sort of art psychotherapy, they would perhaps think that it was um, purely creative based um, in terms of it's purely for a, an artist or a creative but obviously anyone can benefit from it like you allude to so how would one go about accessing art therapy is it something that is even on the NHS is it more of a private thing how do you even access art psychotherapy as a whole yeah so I think it's quite difficult to to find something if you don't know what it is and you haven't heard of it so it is available on the NHS. Um, I was working for Central and North West London and they run it alongside something called mentalization based treatment, which is for personality disorder um, diagnoses. So it is on the NHS, um, but a lot of charities do art therapy as well. 
and there's a lot of private practice so it's more about um knowing that it's out there and being able to find it um and yeah i'd encourage anyone who who would, uh, hasn't heard of it to kind of look into it because it's something people can do um little exercises at home art therapy itself is with a trained professional but there are things that cross over um or aspects you could kind of practice with a drawing if you, if you didn't know how to talk about it you could try and draw it and then talk about it to um to a therapist or maybe just a friend yeah i guess so i mean so i guess a lot of the sort of um elements or techniques that you would perhaps learn are quite quite transferable i suppose into the everyday life i mean like I was saying, it's, it's one of those things uh, or topics or, you know, techniques or whatever that is quite off the radar that a lot of people don't really, haven't really heard of much. Is, I mean, what do you think could be done to sort of put more of a light on art therapy? Art therapy? Because it's obviously a route that you've gone down and you obviously believe works. And like I say, a lot of people just don't know what it is. What do you think could be done to perhaps shine more of a light onto it and perhaps just get it out there a little bit more? I think the reason I was attracted to it is it's very... Um, kind of uh, client led so it's about what the client wants so I think if someone's tried various therapies maybe they've tried CBT or um, maybe some digital therapy just just talking therapy and they've found it hasn't worked for them um, this might be something that they'd quite like to explore but I think also just, um, I don't know trying to get it out there like there are um, associations for art therapy that do a lot of um, lectures and um bits and bobs to get out there but uh yeah i think it's something that's a bit underground at the moment needs a bit of help to come out i know you've mentioned to me um, previously and before this that you you personally suffer from or deal with um anxiety yourself i mean what are some of your earliest memories of um anxiety and some sort of techniques that you use to deal with the anxiety and perhaps how does it affect your day-to-day -day, especially as an art therapist as well I think as a therapist, um, there's a lot of, of emphasis of of the client's experience. When you're a therapist, you're in a room with someone who's coming to you for, for help or support. You don't want to bring too much of yourself into the space. Um, but I also think that um, as a therapist, you need to have some kind of experience of adversity with mental health. You know, if, I, if I'd never been upset, if I'd never um you know had a bad week or you know had some some real down days then there's no way i'd be able to empathize or try to understand how someone's um feeling i was i was trying to think of an example of how i could explain this in like a different way mm. and i was thinking if if you knew you wanted to go on a big hike up a mountain path and you know it'd be really difficult at some points you'd probably want a guide to go with you sure and exactly that guide to, to you know maybe know that particular pathway or know that it would get really difficult and know that they'd got through it as well. So I think as, as the therapist, it's really important that you bring your own experience, in, in, uh, your own experience <laughs> into, the, into the room, not in a way that makes it about you, because uh, it is about the client, but it helps you to have empathy. And I think the more that people know that about therapists, that they're not perfect, they've had their own um, difficulties, hopefully that will kind of make therapy more friendly, more accessible back into the question of anxiety we went on a little little tiny tangent there um so obviously you yourself you know uh, experience a level of anxiety day to day etc etc what are your sort of um, your earliest memories of anxiety and how do you sort of combat the anxiety like for, for today for an interview um or like a little chat i i felt quite nervous um so i just did really simple things like make sure my area feels nice and calm had some food before and just tried to slow down and take my time um and that sounds like a really small thing to do but i feel like so much of um life doesn't let you slow down especially at the moment so that's really important but in terms of earliest memories i used to really struggle to go to like a shopping center or uh, my mum used to go and make me pay for the petrol at the petrol pump and I used to take the money and practice in my head what I would say to the person and then if I stuttered or if they asked me a question I wasn't ready for I was so scared and I wish I could say that the anxiety goes away um I think bits of it do I can now go into a petrol station and have a conversation <laughs> but um I think you get better at dealing with it I think you get stronger and 
that sounds quite cheesy, but I think there are certain things that you grow with rather than um, kind of get controlled by. It is true, though, with the the anxiety thing. I know I know I've uh, sort of dealt with it myself over the years, and I think one one of the one of the ones that comes to mind for me when you were talking about the the petrol pump is um, answering the house phone as a kid. If you remember answering the house phone, that would be a, an, an insane amount of uh, anxiety having to pick up the the house phone and answer the phone. Even even on like an internship or at work, you're like, oh, the phone's ringing. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to answer the phone. It's just, yeah, it's like you, it's like you were saying, sort of, uh, with those who, uh, you know, deal with a level of anxiety, you're constantly sort of rehearsing in your head what you're about to say, if it's in a, a public-facing sort of role or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very tricky. <laughs> right, so, you were, so obviously prior to this uh, conversation, you mentioned to me that disassociation and depersonalization are a couple of the elements that sort of feed into your your daily life as a direct result of anxiety. Could you talk us through what perhaps those two um, topics sort of mean and how you obviously deal with those on the day-to-day? -day? Back to the day-to-day. -day. Back to the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for me, disassociation um, means that I feel disconnected from my body, um, from my thoughts um, and, and my feelings. Um, and this can happen for a couple of minutes or it can go on for hours or it could be you know maybe like a week and what happens is you you kind of lose sense of time so you kind of forget things that have happened you might kind of think oh it's you know that thing where you say oh I can't believe it's it's Wednesday I thought it was still Monday or something it's like your week feels yeah. really long mm. be a bit like that um, but it can also mean that you you don't feel that solid in your identity because if you can't remember things um, and this can come from uh, things like uh, childhood trauma or just quite difficult experiences that have maybe gone somewhere in your mind and occasionally just kind of tap on the front door and say oh remember me and then um, your mind to protect yourself can kind of just go and retreat back inwards to, uh, to try and keep yourself safe. Um, so that's disassociation, mm -hmm. so depersonalization. Um, that's more when your thoughts and your feelings and maybe your body, again, feel unreal. So mm. an example of that is I was on a train a couple of years ago, a beautiful evening coming home from work, and I was watching the sun just kind of move across the train. Um, and I had this strange feeling in my body that I didn't understand why the sun could move across and through things, but my body couldn't. So it's almost like the properties of physics. It sounds really weird, but like the mm -hmm. properties of physics kind of go a bit strange. That's right. It sounds almost like, um, in a way, well, like an uh, like an out of body experience in a way. Then I guess in the, the most simplest uh, terminology. That's probably a much better way to put it. <laughs> <laughs>